Hi, Michael. How are you doing? Um, I'm great. Yourself, Robin? Yeah, fantastic. Thanks. I'm really excited to have you on the show today. I've been following lots of your posts on uh, LinkedIn. It looks like you're up to some really interesting stuff. Maybe to get the ball rolling, you can tell us where you are uh, and what you do. Yeah, so I'm I'm based in Sydney in the in the early morning. You might hear some birds in the background uh, at a company called Nearmap, uh, where I lead the uh, the AI and computer vision group. Uh, what we really do is we we design and build our own camera systems. Well, my group doesn't; the other one does. Design and build camera systems, fly them in planes, do aerial imagery capture over like eighty five percent of the US population and ninety five percent of the Australian population and New Zealand and Canada too. Uh, we turn the images into um, uh, into these big photo maps and 3D structures. We use machine learning to turn that into, um, into information. And then we have apps and APIs and things which expose them to customers. So, uh, yeah, my, my, my thing mainly has been yeah, in the past the, um, the machine learning bit. That's fantastic. So this is very high resolution imagery then? Oh, absolutely. So we our kind of standard base has been about seven and a half centimetres a pixel. Um, a few years ago, we introduced a new camera system and we've been flying that at about five and a half centimetres uh, a pixel and um, just in the process of rolling out a, a shiny new Hyper Camera 3 system, um, which which is a little bit um, similar to resolution, but but you get some really nice clarity improvements and things. Fantastic. And I suppose that with that high resolution comes very high quality analytics and insights that you can generate. You know, one of the most fascinating conversations I've had with with people with more of a satellite background is um, the interplay with what you can do with the texture on high resolution imagery compared mm-hmm. to multi band on a satellite. So, for example, if you're trying to look at the material of a roof, uh, I think in satellite you're kind of looking for reflectance properties in different bands and stuff like that. I'm looking for the physical structure of how shingles and tiles are laid out differently. Um, or the or the ridge lines from a metal roof. So, so that incredible kind of fine detail gives you, you know, you can, you can pick a light pole um, by itself, um, or you can pick, you know, a little area of, of missing shingles on a roof or something like that. Uh, it's 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 a really powerful sweet spot of understanding the built environment in a different yeah. way. There's a very interesting conversation to be had there about how like the sort of different trade-offs of different resolutions because, you know, convolutional neural networks typically pick up on textures. So there must be some sort of threshold at which you suddenly get this extra information and that will, you know, affect the uh, the ability of models trained on that data. Oh, definitely. Uh, you've got, I think, probably a nice example of that trade-off would be we're up to our fifth generation production system now. But between our first and our second, um, in our first, we were all about the maximum resolution of our imagery, basically training and predicting uh, at Zoom 21 on Web Mercado, which is normally seven and a half centimeters a pixel. Uh, and uh, the problem is that at that Zoom level, you can get texture, you get these big commercial buildings, and you're limited by the amount of memory in your GPU. Like you've kind of got a close to infinite image at that Zoom level uh, because you've got a thousand square kilometers in, in one image. Um, but at that zoom level, the whole context window that you can fit in memory is um, is just this sort of bumpy, gravelly surface. And it's not until you zoom out a few times that you realize, oh, that's a big commercial warehouse of some kind. Right. That's a really uh, interesting so- observation there. So, and this is something I'd love to dive into how you would fuse information maybe from different resolutions. Yeah. Well, I, I guess the maybe the important thing to start with is the fact that we run one single global model. Uh, so we, like, if, if you didn't have that, then you just you just train a model for your particular task, right? They're detecting a light pole or mm. um, or some light discoloration on a part of a roof is a different task from a massive commercial warehouse uh, in, in in many respects. But um, I gave the team the goal, uh, which was you know there was some uh, there were some challenges early on with it, but we, we want one model uh, because we wanted the efficiency of running. Uh, so you. Um, we're now up to 78 different layers in a single semantic segmentation model, um, and or each one of them is an independent. Um, it's kind of a multi-label output, so you can have a pixel which is both tree and roof, and then you can work out tree overhang. Um, so you're jamming all that into one model that you run everywhere, and the restriction there is, well, that model has to solve a variety of tasks. It has to pick up 
a power pole by just a few pixels of of the kind of crossbars on top of the power pole, and it has to be able to cl- pick up clean outlines of, you know, maybe you've got a built up commercial roof with kind of gravelly stuff on it, and maybe it's in an area that's got kind of gravelly ground. So so you just lose it with the fine texture. That is, um, so that yeah, is lot, fascinating. Lot I never would have thought to choose one model for such such a wide range of you know uh, scales, for example. Well, if it really comes down to what you're going to do with it. So if you uh, there's there's two there's two real benefits. One one is um, one is efficiency. Right? How many how many times you need to take the RGB pixels and convert them into low level features like edges and corners and things, and then up and up and up. And there's so much shared information, um, it becomes really expensive to run that. Whereas we can pack additional layers into our semantic segmentation model. We've got some sneaky tricks, which I won't talk about, but we can basically pack as many layers as we want in. Um, and um, uh, you're then basically paying the cost of running one convnet in production to produce 78 output layers for different customers. So if you're kind of going all in on, on AI like we have, um, it, it makes a massive difference to your execution cost and we're running on on petabytes of imagery. So you kind of, uh, each cent per square kilometre matters. Fantastic. Is it possible to have a look at your your platform and start looking at some of the, some of the outputs of this? Yeah, I, I, I can model. show you some pictures for, for those who are um, watching the video. Why don't I show you, um, and this will get us into a slightly different domain as well. Um, this is... Uh, an area in, um, let me click this one to get it right. Uh, these are post-catastrophe um, survey that we've done. So we've got this impact response program where we fly as soon as we can. So you can see this one was captured a day after the event. Um, now you won't see it clearly here yet, but this this outline is where the, a tornado went through. Um, but I've got a junk and wreckage layer here. And if I fade out the background, I don't know when you'll start seeing it. Maybe let me know when you start seeing it on your, on your screen. Yeah, there's some some red lines and uh, so, sort of a band so, going across there. So so you'll see this band is actually the swath of damage from the hurricane uh, zoomed out. So sorry, from the tornado zoomed out. The yellow is junk and wreckage. I'll kind of zoom in here a little bit. Um, the yellow is junk and wreckage. The red is vegetation debris, and I've got pink in there for structural damage for roofs and and this kind of thing. So you can kind of move down and see um, and see that damage. I'll give a little background so you can see what's going on. I'm sorry, I'm I'm fighting bandwidth with uh, with Zoom here, mm. and I'm on a 4K monitor, so it's loading a little slowly. So um, get- just so I can understand what I'm looking at, this is the model is detecting pixels associated with uh, particular damage, but it's not doing a change detection. It's literally processing a single image here. Yeah, I mean, for for kind of maximum speed and efficiency. Um, so here you can see some of our imagery at, at uh, around about its full resolution. Um, so uh, yeah, it's it's just looking at single data imagery here because I, I guess when there's a when there's an, when there's an event that goes through, the vast majority of the damage is from that date. You don't tend to have structurally damaged roofs left around mm-hmm. for too long. Um, you can always go back and look at the previous date, but it just it, it lets you move a bit faster and a bit more easily to do single date. So and that's here. The pig color is that associated with damage to roofs, or is that any kind of damage? This, this is just structural damage to roofs. So damage. if I if I fade that out. Um, you can see that that's basically the semantic segmentation output from our model mm. um, in in a fairly raw form, and we then do a whole bunch of geospatial post processing to clean it up and vectorize it and and link attributes and all sorts of stuff. But this is yeah. this is basically the model, and then you yeah. can see there's if I jump in, there's a long long list here. But if I go for junk and wreckage, I can um, I can bring that yellow stuff in and out, um, and that's just all the uh, all the stuff, which is, you know, we, we've actually got an ontologist who um, who does all our uh, um, uh, definitions. So the junk and wreckage layer is any junk or wreckage manufactured by humans and now discarded from its original use. That's the, sh- the short definition. And then the long one is, you know, all about what's included and what's excluded because we're, we're training this model on a data set that's, you know, extensively labelled. Mm. I think it's more than a million labelled images. So each each layer has kind of a definition set like this and a whole bunch of labelling instructions 
on what is and isn't considered part of that because as your listeners know uh basically a, a deep learning model can learn to reliably detect what is in an image as long as a human can reliably detect it so it actually becomes yeah. less about the algorithm when you've got lots of labeling going on high quality imagery it's actually much more about the definitions and and being consistent with them than it is about the fancy algorithm we, we do do lots of tweaks to the algorithms to improve over time like there's mm-hmm. I think, gosh, with our, with our current generation, we originally started way back with kind of a Deep Lab V3 type model, uh, but it doesn't look much like that anymore because of all these customizations. Like, how do you how do you tile when you're when you're running? How do you tile a model kind of next to itself and get perfect edges? Mm. Or how do you run at different scales? Or how do you um, how do you run efficiently and pack all those extra layers in yeah. without blowing your memory out? So yeah, the team's done an incredible job of. Um, building our own kind of architecture that is um is, is pretty unique that's really exciting and interesting to hear about i'm curious also is it is it able to absorb imagery at different resolutions or do you you choose a particular resolution and stick with that always yeah so uh look i i i can share we we do so we all we're always running at some 21 kind of that um that native resolution at least of our early camera systems um, because that gives the best balance between a cost trade-off and and being able to detect even mm-hmm. even a few missing shingles, kind of little little patch after a storm or something like that. Um, however, we do do some multi-scale stuff because of things like those large roofs. and mm-hmm. um, but we, we it is genuinely one model, um, and we have one um, you know we have one execution pipeline that's it's this whole computational graph of algorithms that run. Um, uh, you know, we do things like clean up the boundaries of buildings to be nice, clean, straight edges and and pull from our 3D data to work out building heights and all that kind of stuff. Um, yeah. So there's that whole execution path. And then maybe I can actually I'll share screen again quickly. I think we're, we're the only AI company I've, I've come across that actually says in detail what we do on our, on our public websites. So I mm-hmm. may as well show that. Yeah. Um, so this is uh, our Gen 5. Uh, so these are our... our uh, product documentation you can anyone can jump on and have a look uh, and we've actually got our version history you know you can it's a semantic uh sorry it's it's a semverse style versioning system for for data um you know so the generation is kind of the major version of the data and then you know the latest one is tranquil pool uh, which is just a we, we, we've got some nuances to what the names mean and then there's there's things that happen on the fly to the data um so you can go back and look at our change log all the way back to you know if we go back to Gen 3, you can see the various versions of Gen 3 that got released in Gen mm-hmm. 4. Um, and this is this is really important for a lot of our customers who, like, yes, it's great to train a machine learning model as a one-off or for, for a project, but if they're basing things like risk uh, and underwriting decisions on it or you're trying to assess, um, you know, what what has happened in your in your town in terms of vegetation history, you mm-hmm. kind of need to have proper lineage of the data and where it comes from. So. So even little patch tweaks um, that we make um, end, end up in our versioning system. That's so, fascinating. Um, and is it is it a global model, or do you find that you get sort of better precision if you target, say, Australia versus North America? Hundred uh, percent global model at the moment, um, and we've done. So we run in, in four countries. We run the same model. Uh, in fact, we had a really interesting test point when we we started off just running and training it on data from the US and Australia. Uh, and then we expanded it to Canada and New Zealand. And as you validate it, we kind of found that the model actually already performed really well in Canada and New Zealand, even though it wasn't trained on their data, because there's enough kind of variation between Australia and the US that um, it captures that sort of stuff. But then we wind in more training data. So each generation where we're constantly, you know, we've got kind of 100, 100 or more labelers just labeling, labeling data. Um, so every time we fly surveys, we run the full survey. We can then kind of do sampling strategies based on statistics that come out of that, right? Like if you see a if you see a car in the middle of the ocean or a building in the middle of the ocean, because the, the car and the or the building and the and the water layers overlap, then you might want to flag that for labeling. Uh, or if the model expresses uncertainty, you know, the mm. most deep learning models, you're kind of jammed between you're jammed near zero percent and hundred percent confidence output. Um, but uh, if you're in the middle somewhere. The model's probably confused, so you might want to go and label that area. So it's this constant right. cycle of 
get the best and latest model, um, then go and um, uh, and run it and label it and and wind through. So typically, we do a with each, each of our generations, we we roll out a new deep learning model, um, uh, which sometimes has improved architecture and things as well. But mm-hmm. um, mostly, it's it's got new classes in it. I think Gen four to Gen five went from forty nine layers to seventy eight layers. Um, so you can imagine the team kind of figuring out how to make sure each of the layers performs well. And you, you've got a, it's this dance of um, all these layers and the performance of them and you're watching the model converge and oh. you're trying to make sure, it, like, because the spec is nothing can get worse, right? Yeah. That's you, can, you can't have, great, we did really well in all, all these layers, but these three important production layers went downhill in performance. Yeah. That's not okay. So, yeah, they, again, they tie themselves in knots with training schemes and 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 loss functions and all sorts of things to get things working well. Fascinating. And do you have a single, a single metric that yeah. you report for all of the, all of the, the layers or do some layers have different metrics? Well, the, I mean, the metrics, the same metric means different things for different layers. So if you look at your, your IOU, your intersection over union, um, that's kind of a pretty common measure of, um, of quality for a, um, for a semantic segmentation output. But the way it works is very heavily biased against small objects compared to large objects. So you might see a much lower IOU for a power pole um, or a little swimming pool compared to a large building. Um, but when you when you visually look at the data, you say, "Oh, that's actually a really good result." Mm. Because even a you know when it's a small object, even a slight wobble around the edge that uh, really hurts that score. So we do produce scores. Um, we're actually um, really pleased by something we started doing in Gen 5, which was an automated difference report. So we'll run on thousands of square kilometers. We'll do unsupervised comparisons head to head of the models and and also supervised comparisons. And then to our um, our customers, we're giving this report that kind of says exactly how does the model behave differently compared to the previous one mm. so that they know, you know, what they need to change in their systems. And usually it's it's kind of nipping off corner cases, improving a bit here, improving a bit there. Um, you know, we don't change the meaning of a layer. We'll we'll add a new layer rather than do that because that's reasonably cost effective to do. Uh, yeah. yeah, there's there's just it, it's amazing to see. Like I, I started this journey six years ago, uh, and we were going to knock a product out with you know two or three people, and there's now like thirty odd people, um, and we're still going. There's just every time you do something, you go, oh, but if we're going to do this well, we've got to add that or think about that, and you just mm. encounter these problems that you didn't expect to to have to deal with. But it's fun. You, hit, you hinted at uh, lots of architectural improvements as well. I'm curious yeah. how you how you select directions to go in. Do you do you follow published research? Do you have sort of internal okay. experiments that you run, or uh, a bit of both? Um, I mean, at our size, when you've got kind of that twenty or thirty person group, and I don't know, maybe maybe ten or so are deep learning people. You can't afford to be out there doing the groundbreaking research that publishes a new academic paper and and changes how everyone does things. Like we've got stuff that we could actually publish papers on, but we, you know, it's the trade off between IP and um and, and getting things out there. Um, but what what we, t- what we tend to do is look at the latest research because there's people doing some really great stuff out there with imagery. Right? There's I don't know how many billions of dollars is being poured into improving, you know, for example, semantic segmentation results. In imagery so we'll take the best of that and then we'll think well how's our problem different how's our problem special and you've got this infinite image you know about the scale so you're not dealing with arbitrarily scaled objects um the rotations kind of mean something different when you're looking top down so so the team is really very good at looking at the latest research and then adapting it to say well what's special about near map and it's not even just that we've got that 2d um you know, we're doing models now that in, include a, a depth channel as well from our um, from our 3D models. So, you know, you've, you're kind of trying to predict, you know, is it a building or not? If you look perfectly top down and it looks like a car park, mm. how do you know if it's a car park on top of the building or not? So you kind of start to need that elevation channel to, to get into the next layer. And, um, you know, you don't find that many stock models out there that take geospatial data and an elevation channel. So yeah. there's, there's there's a lot of there's a lot of customization and adaptation that has to happen and adaptation. Um, but um, yeah, we certainly we certainly do look at the latest research. And are there any other sort of modalities that you commonly uh, would fuse with the data? Maybe for some some classes you mentioned elevation, 
uh, mm. maps for buildings. Is is it just elevation maps or anything else? Uh, yeah. So so we early on we focused really heavily on near map generated content, uh, and that's because you know we have this unique data set that's tens of petabytes in size, and we know exactly everything about it, so you can really optimize for it. Um, now, um, we're, I mean, we're constantly doing more things like the new camera system has a near infrared channel, uh, which we're really excited to get to find out what new information is genuinely in that channel. Um, yeah, historically people use defined vegetation, but we can find that from texture, but they're also using it for vegetation health and water content and that kind mm. of thing. So I'm expecting more information there. Um, uh, and, and we are starting to weave in some some other third party data, but really the front and center. This is about not just doing deep learning on aerial imagery. It's about deep learning on near map imagery. And you know when you kind of sit with the guys who did the color balancing and deal with saturation and and know how the surveys were processed, um, you uh, you can do things uh, in a way that you simply can't if you're trying to look at it as, as just like a generic set of of aerial imagery. Fantastic. And one last question. Can I ask you about the tech stack? Do you, are you sort of Python people or is there a mixture uh, of languages in there? Oh, we're, we, we had a bit of Golang for a bit because um, our, um, like our front, sorry, not our front end teams, our, our API teams use, use a lot of Golang. Um, so we, we've had some of that in the back end, but we're, uh, look for when you're doing imagery, geospatial, deep learning, uh, all of it is an extensive Python ecosystem. So we, we're, we're probably 90% Python, maybe maybe 10% C++. Uh, in the vision team, we're, we're much more C++ because it's, you know, that, that's been going on as a much longer effort and you've got to really optimize every single scrap you get out of it. Yeah, um, yeah and, and we've just migrated actually from, from TensorFlow to PyTorch. Um, that's right. the big controversial move. We were talking about doing that for a couple of years and we're, we're now there. Um, that's a good one. Was there a particular reason for the jump? There are a number. Um, I'm, I'm pretty resistant to changes generally for the sake of it. Um, so I was like, oh, we'll stick with TensorFlow. That's, that should be great for everything. Um, and, and you saw that groundswell of movement towards PyTorch in the research field. So I had my, my R&D team saying, look, all these papers that are out there that come with PyTorch code and it's just so easy to work with and, and manipulate. Um, but then I had my my kind of engineering teams also saying we we should switch to PyTorch because we would at that point we were looking at um, you know we were doing multi GPU training on a couple of GPUs but as you want to expand to a full node of like eight GPUs and then do multi node um, they just kept hitting problems with the way we were trying to do it in TensorFlow that just worked much more easily in PyTorch so mm. when I had all my teams telling me PyTorch PyTorch we <laughs> we eventually ripped, ripped the band-aid and made the switch and um uh it's it's been good so far that's really good to hear fantastic uh thank you so much for sharing so many details and presenting this really fascinating look into the work you're doing there if people want to follow along uh the developments where's the best place for them to do that ah well um so you can get um you can get both the company um and myself on on linkedin and twitter um probably more active on linkedin than twitter um, nearmap.com, N-E-A-R-M-A-P.com uh, is the website. Uh, docs.nearmap.com is if you want to actually see the technical stuff that's, mm. that's written up about our product. So for your listeners, that's probably the place. Just search for Nearmap AI. Um, Fantastic. I'll put that in the show notes as well for everybody. Well, once again, thank you and hope to catch up with you again in the future. Great. Great to chat, Robin. Looking forward to it. Bye.